Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all here on a beautiful Sunday morning. Glad you were able to get out and brave a little bit of the icy roads that are left. And I want to begin by saying thank you to our ushers and um, to some of our community members who came out and helped clean off the parking lot and the sidewalks. And uh, um, and some, some of our just uh, like Shane Harris and some of the others on the trustees and Sam White for, for coming out to, to do that yesterday. Uh, much appreciated, and definitely we would not be having church had they not done that, because as you can tell, yeah, thank you. Indeed, I know they didn't do it to, to get applause, but they definitely came out and were, were very helpful, and appreciate uh, Rodney's uh, son-in-law and, uh, son and, son in and grandson-in-law for coming out and uh, providing some of the muscle through the tractors, and also local Robin Roads across the street for coming out and, and doing some of that. We wouldn't be able to be here without that. So I really wasn't prone to the idea of trying to cancel church again. You know, it seemed like we just got over doing that for a long period of time. So I'm glad that we could uh, gather this morning. Thank you for being here. If you join us online, uh, if you haven't been out much, the roads and spots are slick. The main roads are pretty clear, but uh, secondary roads, so be safe as you get out. And all of you, I hope uh, we can all be safe and get back into a normal weather scenario, right? Even though snow was nice, I'm ready for uh, springtime to be just around the corner, which is not far away. This morning as we gather, I invite you to, to join with me and stand as you're able as we join together in the affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed, our historic remembrance of that apostolic faith, which is the foundation for the truth and life of the church. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day He rose from the dead, He ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Y'all sound like an army at war there. That sounded good to hear all of you together. Uh, we'll be working on some spots uh, for everybody to sit. We're a little packed today. Um, but we're trying to do the best we can to get everybody into this one service. Thank you so much again for being here. Would you pray with me? Almighty and everlasting Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to worship you today. We're thankful for hands willing to serve and hearts, Lord, willing to come and to, to worship you. Lord, I just pray that you would bless us, that indeed you would hear our, our cries of thanksgiving, our hymns of praise, Lord. And Lord, as we offer to you our need, may we find your presence here, healing, restoring, and redeeming. We thank you for all that you do for us. And Lord, we ask now that you help us to worship you for all that you are. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated.
Like the sound of the symphony to my ears. It's like holy water, your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of the symphony to my ears. It's like holy Would the children please come forward for this time of children's blessing? Let's go find a rock to sit by up here, our kneeling rail here. Then we'll have a children's church for those of our younger ones too after this. All right. It's good to see all of you guys. Um, we talked about this a little over a year ago, but do you know where you are right now? In the church. In the church? Yeah, we're in the church. But you know that uh, the church has been seen as something even uh, different than that in, in its great history. Uh, have y'all ever, ever been on water? Y'all like to swim or anything? Like to, like to swim? Like to play in the water? Don't like to play in the water? Well, I'm not a big uh, water person either, um, but occasionally I like to swim if given the chance. But did you know that, that what we're in right now is something the Bible teaches us that goes on water? The church is something that goes on water. Can you guess what it might be? It's a boat. Yeah, that's exactly what the Scriptures teach us. You don't think so? Well, you may to prove it. You may go back and we'll read, this, read it together. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do that to you. <laughs> yeah, but that's what the Bible teaches us exactly, that we are in a great boat, an ark. Remember the story in the Bible when, when God was going to, it was up on our screens a little bit ago, uh, when, when God was going to judge the earth, but he, he got this guy named uh, Noah, and Noah built a boat and saved his family through this great flood. You remember that story? Well, I know, that's true. He, he, you're right. He didn't build a church. But the church has always been seen to be something like Noah's Ark, where people come to be saved, where people come to be safe, where people come to, to when, the, when the waters rise and the storms come, where we come to, to have protection by God. That's what the Bible teaches us, that you and I, when we come to church, when we come to faith in Jesus, when we, when we come to, to be together in hope, all of us are actually entering into God's boat that protects us from the storm. So when we get afraid or we, we get terrified or, or we have storms in life, things don't go the way we want to, that we can come to church, we can come to those people who love us, and we can come to God and know that He will save us. What's that, Tucker? You go to your house? Yeah, well, you can do that too, absolutely. And that's part of the church too. Even your house is part of the church. Do you believe that? He did. Did y'all get to go? 
Not yet, but you will. You will, right? You will. So I want you to remember when you come to church that you're not only coming to a place where we sing and we read Scripture and we learn lessons about God, but you're coming to a place that can keep you safe, can bless you when the waters rise and the storms come, okay? We have faith in Jesus. Would you pray with me? Father God, I thank you so much for these children. I thank you, Lord, for, for their wisdom, Lord, for their truth, Lord, as they speak to us in love. I thank you so much for each and every one of them, the joy they bring to us. And I pray that you'd watch over and keep them safe. Lord, that you'd bless them, that they would always love you and run to you. Lord, when the waters are rising in their life, may they know they can be safe in this great ship of the church. Oh, Father God, I pray that you'd bless them and strengthen them. In Christ's name, amen. All right, you're dismissed for Children's Church. You can see you've got people at each door if you'd like to go to Children's Church. The time of children's blessing can be um, some of the most encouraging and frightening things that the preachers ever experience, right? And I tell you, they're always thinking about what you're saying, too. And, they, and that's, a, that's a great joy. I hope we continue to encourage our children uh, to so pursue their faith with thought and questions. If you notice, many times in my sermons, I, I begin with questions or use many questions, and I think that's an important part of our life together. I want to say a word of, uh, of, of, of thanksgiving uh, this morning that uh, one of our own is, uh, is here. Liam yesterday was injured in kind of a, a freak accident playing in the snow and uh, really was at the emergency room last night to have stitches and they thought they might have to put him under actually um, and, but he braved it out and toughed it out and so we're proud that, where'd he go? Is he in the back? He went in the back. Okay. But uh, we're proud that, uh, that he has, uh, has done so well and was determined to come to church this morning, right? Yeah, so that's great. So we are proud of, uh, of Liam and glad that he did not have to be uh, uh, put under to, to have that surgery or have his stitches yesterday. So we're grateful for that. I know it was probably a, a, a heart-pounding experience for mom and dad, wasn't it, to, when, they, when they say things like that? Will says just mom. Yeah, we men are too tough for that, right? Yeah, I, um, one of my co-workers at Lambeth one time, in fact, I was at a, my wife and my children and I were at a school function at the middle school with the band, and we saw the ambulances at the soccer fields. We're like, oh, no, what's going on? Well, it turns out somebody had broken their leg playing soccer, a child had, and, uh, and it actually protruded from the skin, and uh, somebody passed out. Well, the father passed out, uh, and he was a combat veteran, so he'd seen a lot of stuff, but it was something different about seeing his child um, injured. So anyway, um, yeah, it's tough when your kids are hurt, but we're so glad that, that Liam, Liam's doing well. Yeah, when I was a kid, if I had gotten a chance to not come to church, man, I, I wanted to do that, because on Sunday morning, Get Smart came on. You, remember? you know, he talked on his shoe, remember that? And I never got to watch Get Smart because it was during church, unless on a rare occasion I was ill of some sort. And if my family, if you aren't bleeding, broken, or visibly sick, you went to church. That's just the way it was. So anyway, um, glad Liam is, is doing well. We also want to pray this morning for the family of Annie Mae Banks, who has um, relatives within this congregation who passed away. And there are many, many prayer concerns um, that, are, that we have on our list. And I don't know if you've got one today. Did we have one out today, Allison? We didn't have one out today. It was a little tough traveling to church uh, to, to get some of our stuff done. But uh, you, you do have one from last week. And we'll update that. We'll put that on Facebook tomorrow and send out an email about our prayer concerns. But there are many, many we want to continue to remember. We do want to remember Miss Geneva Wright, Tracy's mother, who will begin her chemo, is that right, uh, this week for uh, breast cancer. And, uh, and you've seen so many needs within our community. So let's continue to pray for them and lift each other up daily in our prayers. And now, if you don't mind, let's bow together to pray together um, to our Lord and to follow with our prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Father, we thank you so much that we can gather this morning with joy in our hearts, grateful that we are able to assemble before you. For Lord, we know that you're here in our presence. You've promised that you'll be here with us, Lord. 
And we perceive that presence today. Lord, we hear it and perceive it within our songs, within the joy of our children, within their honesty and their truth. We, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for the gift of being able to shepherd, Lord, for your kingdom's sake, those who are growing and maturing in their faith. We're thankful, Lord, for, uh, for souls bent on service uh, that helped us assemble today. We're thankful, Lord, for the opportunity that we have been given this week to stay warm and safe, to have food upon our tables. Lord, we see many in our nation who were dealt different circumstances, and we pray, Lord, for, for your blessings upon them. We pray for all those this week who may have been unable to work, Lord, and may have lost income and may indeed be in need during these moments. We pray that you would bless them and strengthen them and provide for them. We pray for the many who are often hungry, the many who are heartbroken, the many who are mourning, many who are sick, Lord, those who are suffering. We pray that you would touch them, that you would heal them, that you would make them well and provide for them in the name of your Son, Jesus. And Father, this morning we, we say... Lord, with, with great humility, thanks, Lord, to you for how you watch over us and care for us. And we pray your blessings for those who you've inspired to use their life to watch over and care for us. Lord, we pray for our doctors and nurses, for our paramedics and EMTs, our police officers and our firefighters, and all of our armed service personnel. Lord, we pray for all of these who in these Recent months have seen much tragedy and suffering. Lord, we, we know, we know, Lord, they carry heavy burdens. We pray your strength to be upon them. We especially pray for those who've seen the horrors of war, Lord, and participated in them. Give them strength. Help them to be restored and renewed in your image. And Father, we, we pray for those who've lost their way, for those who struggle against drug and alcohol addiction, for those who, Lord, struggle against the many addictions that we find in our life. God, we pray that we may be set free, all of us, no matter what our, our problem or pain, that we may be set free to serve you with a good conscience and with joy, remembering it through faith that we've been cleansed through our baptism and through the love and truth we find here in a community of believers. Now, Father, we pray that you would help us to love you more. Help us to be reinvigorated in our passion to serve you. Help us to live in faith and in hope and to trust that your love will never fail us. Oh, Father, we ask all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus, who taught his disciples to pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This morning our scripture lesson comes from Acts, the 27th chapter, verses 13 through 31. And since I know none of you have been sitting around this week, right? None of you have, have had to take some time off and enjoyed that. I'm just going to, even as a grace for all of you, we're going to just sit today as we read this lesson, as we hear it recorded by Luke, who uh, compiled in the book of Acts, the narrative of the early church. Acts chapter 27, beginning in verse 13. And you may remain seated during this reading. This is an account of a shipwreck and a storm that Paul, the great evangelist of the church, experienced as he was heading to Rome under really some difficult circumstances. When a moderate south wind began to blow, they thought they could achieve their purpose. So they weighed anchor and began to sail past Crete, close to the shore. But soon a violent wind, called the Nor'easter, rushed down from Crete. Since the ship was caught and could not be turned head-on into the wind, 
we gave way to it and were driven. By running under the lee of a small island called Caudia, we were scarcely able to get the ship's bolt under control. After hoisting it up, they took measures to undergird the ship. Then fearing that they would run on the cetrus, they lowered the sea anchor and so were driven. We were being pounded by the storm so violently that on the next day they began to throw the cargo overboard. And on the third day, with their own hands, they threw the ship's tackle overboard. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest raged, all hope of being saved was at last abandoned. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul then stood up among them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete, and thereby avoided this damage and loss. I urge you now to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For last night there stood by me an angel of God, to whom I belong and whom I worship. And he said, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before the emperor, and indeed God has granted safety to all those who are sailing with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will be exactly as I have been told. But we will have to run aground on some island. When the fourteenth night had come, as we were drifting across the sea of Adria, about midnight the sailors suspected they were nearing land. So they took soundings and found twenty fathoms. A little farther on they took soundings again and found fifteen fathoms. Fearing that we might run on the rocks, they let down four anchors from the stern and prayed for day to come. But when the sailors tried to escape from the ship and had lowered the boat into the sea on the pretext of putting out anchors from the bow, Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut away the ropes of the boat and set it adrift. Thus endeth the reading the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Come Holy Spirit, come. Come as the light and reveal. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the wind and cleanse. Convict, convert, consecrate until we are wholly thine. Amen. This morning I want us to think on the subject of riding the ship loosing the boats. I've read this passage of Scripture several times in my life. I mean, it's a pretty much a harrowing experience that, that Luke records with great skill. Luke's there too, witnessing this. It's an amazing feat of, of survival, which will go on in a few more chapters, where, or a few more verses rather, where Paul will actually, and most of the shipmates will be saved, but Paul will be bitten, bitten by a poisonous viper and survives, and he's worshipped as a god, they think because he's survived a shipwreck and has been bitten by a viper and not died, that he's some kind of god, and so um, Paul is given the opportunity to evangelize to persons that he never would have initially. I've never spent much time thinking about this narrative, really, uh, simply because it is a narrative, and um, Though I love the narratives of the Old Testament, this almost seems out of place in the context of the New Testament. Though Acts is filled with the narrative of the church, this seems to go on at great length about things I'm not interested in because I have a fear. I think it was Brady Rich over here said he didn't really like the water. Was that right? No, was it Brady? Brady said that earlier? Uh, um, yeah, so people don't like the water. I, I'm, I'm that guy, right? I don't, I don't like the water. In fact, uh, I mean, I don't mind going to the ocean, but I do not want to get out on the ocean because if I can't walk on it, I don't need to be on it, right? Maybe it's my fear of, really, the, the fear is not so much of water as it is being in a storm on the sea. I, I sometimes watch Deadliest Catch. You ever watch that show? Man, those guys have some courage to be out there on those waves in, in such turbulent seas. I could never do it. Well, maybe I've avoided that passage for that. I've, I've read through it many times and not paid much attention to it. In fact, for me, it's been very much like uh, a passages which I find early on in the beginning of, uh, of the book of First Chronicles. 
to me, which is part of the most boring sections of Scripture that I read. Now, I mean, I've, I read the, the entire Bible. Usually once a year I try to do that. And uh, when, I, when I do that, when I come to the, the beginning of Chronicles and we get all these lists of people, man, it's just boring. Now, I read it because I'm ADD. I'm not ADD. I'm, well, I am that too, as you can tell. Um, but I'm obsessive compulsive about reading. For me, reading is not reading the first and last sentences and getting the general idea. For me, reading is reading every word because whoever wrote it intended to write it that way. I, that's the way I read. I'm sorry. I'm working through, as I've said a few weeks ago, uh, a biography of John D. Rockefeller, and I, really not my favorite book, though it's an interesting subject. The guy's hard to read, but I promise you, I read every word of it. I labor through it. I've labored through Acts and uh, Chronicles many times, and for me, Acts and this passage from Chronicles with all these weird names are about the same, at least this part in Acts 27. It doesn't really hold my attention until this year. When I read Acts 27 in January of this year, it has compelled me in a way that's never compelled me before. It's been on my mind for almost every day, this story of Paul being on a ship. I don't know why it came to life, but it did. This, th these waves breaking over, spraying salty sea and winds pushing a ship with abandon across the ocean in the dead of winter. I mean, it would be the most horrible fate I could imagine happening in my life. It captivated me for some reason. Definitely, it sent ripples of resonance raging through my mind. Truth is, it's a pretty well-written narrative of events. Luke was a good writer of history. But I don't know why it so baffled me this year. It's hard to see, I know, but that's a ship breaking through the waters. It's a little dark with, uh, with the background there. I mean, I wonder what it would have been like to be on that ship. Can you imagine if you were a sailor and you began to abandon everything just to stay above the water? Because they did. First, it was the cargo. How did sailors make their living? By taking cargo to and fro. They were basically freighters, right? They, first, they abandoned their cargo, then their tackle. They throw it all overboard. Then they throw their wheat at last. They have anchors which they, they sever. You'll see it later on. They begin to cut anchors. They do everything they can just to stay above the water. You ever felt like that in life? Just hoping that we won't sink. Well, I don't know what the name of the boat was they got on and were trying to make their destination for Rome. And Paul really wanted to go to Rome to preach the gospel there, to teach in, in, the, in the great schools of thought that existed in Rome itself. Now, I doubt that Paul ever wanted to sail such a wave there. Paul was a prisoner at this point. He was guarded by centurion and soldiers. In fact, at one point at the end of the story, after they crash, they're going to kill Paul because if they were to lose their, their, their prisoners, they could suffer death. But the centurion... It's fascinated by Paul. They won't let him be killed. Right? I doubt even though Paul wanted to go to Rome, he wanted to go as a prisoner. I also doubt that he wanted to get there by means of going through a terrible storm. Not much fun. I don't know what the name of the ship was that he got on, but I wonder if it was this. That's Greek. I can't read Greek. We've got one person at least here that can. And so I looked this up, may not be right, but we're going to play like it is. You know what that says in Greek? 2020. 20. <laughs> Don't you wonder what the name of the ship was? Last year we began a process, each of us as individuals, 50 weeks ago. 50 weeks ago, we began a process of throwing our cargo overboard throwing our tackle, doing everything that we could do just to stay above the rising seas. Is that not true? It is true. In fact, we threw things overboard that I never thought would be possible. As a church, we threw over our cargo, which is our purpose. We had to, to try just to, to stay alive. 
It was a surreal feeling for to come to church for the first time and it was just us here. You guys didn't experience that when you were at home watching, but we did. We would come and lead worship and nobody was in here. It was weird. Thank God for the people who finally put up the poster boards in here for us. At least we felt like we were speaking to somebody. In other ways, I think we have thrown overboard our purpose in life. Many of us have curtailed our lives personally in ways we never thought we, we would have to. We threw over our tackle. The means in which we navigated life before have never been the same. They haven't been since, have they? Maybe they will be. We threw over our provisions, that which feeds our community in many ways. And our anchors, that which grounds us, sometimes were cut. Do you ever feel like that in your life in 2020, that these things that anchor us, many of the people who needed community the most, people in drug and alcohol therapy groups like Alcoholics Anonymous and NA, they had to abandon those things. And you know what's going on in those communities? They've seen the highest rates of relapse that they've ever seen for the generations that are now involved in AA. Counselors tell us that they are overrun and overwhelmed because life is catching up to all of us. It's a hard time. And I feel like that we imagine that the hard times are behind us. The truth is it's all catching up with us right now. The way our communities have been severed and changed are piling up on people. It's happening around us. Drug and alcohol addiction for people who normally don't use things out of order is moving exponentially at a rate of growth. Folks, if you haven't figured it out, we're taking on water in many ways in our efforts to right the ship. Paul says that, uh, or Luke puts in the words of the, uh, the great words of, uh, of the scriptures there, that at last everyone had abandoned hope. Abandoned hope. I think Dante had something like that when he speaks about the inferno. Abandon all hope here, or something to that effect about hell and his great work, the inferno, paradise. The church has forever been seen in three ways, theologically. The first we've been seen is the body of Christ. Right? You remember that? You remember when, uh, when Paul is Saul, he's persecuting the church and he meets Jesus on the road? Y'all remember that story? To Damascus and after when Paul is blinded by Jesus, he says in a voice to Paul, he says, why are you persecuting me? Who had Paul been persecuting? He'd been persecuting the church. We are the body of Christ to the world around us. We too are the bride of Christ, which is Jesus' most common analogy, that he loves us just as if we are his bride. He loves us with a solitary and singular passion, the church. If you want to see what that kind of love looks like, read the song of songs that Solomon wrote. It's about us and the church, the early church said. But what did I tell the kids we were in? I don't think they much believe me, but we're in a ship right now. We're in a boat, the great ark of salvation. And this one's got an American flag on there, so I know next week we won't be having church services because I've mistakenly said that God loves America. Let me say this. God loves America. He loves Europe. He loves everybody. He loves every nation. He loves us so long as we love Him, right? And despite our inability to love Him. So if the Facebook gods are listening, we want to have service online next week, right? And let me be the first to say, I do love America, all right? That has nothing to do with it. That was the best ship I could find. Here we are. We indeed are on a sailing vessel. You and I, the church together, which exists in many denominations throughout this world, some who are meeting today, some who are not, who meet at different times during the week, who meet all across every culture, we are the great ark of God's salvation. It is to the church which we're supposed to run to be saved from the ways and the trials and tribulations of the world. 
That's why it's so dangerous within the history of the church when the church begins to fight inside of itself because we are missing the purpose and opportunity which God has created us for, which is to make disciples for Jesus Christ so that the world may be transformed. Today, you and I, even as we crowd together, which just seems crowded, right? A year ago, we said, oh, this is an okay crowd. Now we're excited that it sounds like an army is out there saying the Apostles' Creed, right? You and I need to realize where we are and what God wants for us. This Sunday, today, marks the first Sunday in what season? Lent. If 2020 were christened the ship, it would have been Lent. Basically, all we did in the church was get rid of things and try to add them back slowly, but it's been difficult to do. In our lives, we've gotten rid of many things. How many of our young people lost their spring sports season? I can see two sitting right over here who did, right? How many band members lost their band season? Well, pretty much so. Most everybody would say ours did, even though they tried. How many kids in Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts didn't get to meet? For a long time, most of them. In other words, personally, we've been abandoning many things which made life the way we knew it. So I'll be honest. As I began to think about Lent this year, I'm like, God, did it ever end in 2020? Have we not been getting rid of things slowly over and over again? That's what it seems like to me. And at the head of the, of the ship, seems like it might have been these two guys. Right? The Skipper and Gilligan. I mean, what does this year come to? I know we're in 2021 now. There's no doubt about it. I'm sick and tired of getting rid of things. It's time for me spiritually to realize that I'm not going to do Lent this year the way it's always been done. Yeah, I'll fast. I'll do that. I hope you consider to do those things. But this year, I don't think you and I need to focus on getting rid of anything. You and I need to focus on what we can add back to our life to grab a hold of the purpose which God has created us for individually and collectively. Because that's the second part of Lent. Lent's not only emptying ourselves, but it's adding to. This year, we're going to focus on, on building back our life, riding the ship of faith within us internally and with us collectively. Because we've got to do it. It is time you and I begin to sail again as people of hope, as people of faith, as people who know and are called to change the world and not fear what the world can throw at us. It's time, folks, to right the ship and to loose the boats. Now, loose the boats. The passage of Scripture here. You might have seen it in there. And I didn't think much about this until over our snow days that Bryce and our family, we watched Master and Commander. Is that right? Something like that? Master and Commander? Master and Commander? And I didn't realize this, but the lifeboats which we see on ships and we think about were often used back in maritime, and I guess they could still be used today if they had, they had propels. And they were used to right the ship. They were used to turn it when they sometimes couldn't turn it. They were used to balance the ship at times. They could put pressure on it from a smaller ship, a smaller boat, to help get the right direction. This happens in our passage of Scripture. They get the boats out trying to turn it, but they can't, so they host the, the smaller boats up onto the ship. Here, as the story got worse and worse, and trust me, I'd have been one of these guys trying to get out of there, if I'm being honest, the sailors begin to lower a boat into the sea on the pretext that they're going to put anchors out, right, and try to save them. But what are they really going to do? We're abandoning ship. Correct? Paul says they can't do that. If they abandon ship, we won't be saved. So what does Paul tell them to do? Cut the ropes to the boats. We're all in this together. It's time as people of faith, we remember we're better together in a very faithful way. You and I, it's time that we realize 
that you and I can't just exist as we've been existing. You and I can't run to the small ships, the small boats that we've been trying to navigate our life with. We've got to run back to the church. We've got to run back and be filled with faith and encouragement with each other. We need each other. And God purposed us to fulfill the needs of others through our church. To be frank, I think we've done a pretty good job. We've continued on when some people have stopped and started more than once. I'm proud of our worship team. I'm proud of those who've continued to come and worship. I'm proud of you guys for joining us online. But it's time we right the ship. That's what we're going to begin to do. We're going to start back with our Sunday school services on March the 7th. That's right. We're going to start doing that. And you guys are going to be encouraged to come. And I hope you are encouraged to come. Because you may feel like, I'm in my lifeboat, I'm doing pretty good. There are other people sitting amongst you who feel like they're sinking. We need community. And our community needs us. I was late coming into service today because I got a phone call of a, of a young man desperate for help. Didn't get to work last week. Can't pay his rent. His wife is pregnant. You know, we hear stories like this a lot, but I think he was absolutely being honest. He was in desperation. Folks, it's time. It's time. Let's cut away the boats that we've been trying to make do on. Let's run again to the church. Let's strengthen our faith together. Let's head for the dream. For Paul, it was Rome, where he might change the world. For us, it's here at home, where we might affect change for all those around us. Are you ready? Through Lent this year, we'll be talking about how we can right the ship, personally and collectively. Next week, we'll... We'll talk about the temptation of Christ and the power that you and I need to find in realizing what goes on around us and how we're grounded through it, the anchor of Jesus. Then we'll continue on from there. Are you ready? Are you ready to live in faith again? Are you ready to put aside fears? I am. God did not call us to defeat. God's got a purpose for us, and He does. He'll direct us again to a new day, to the calling through Jesus Christ. Let's be faithful. Let's start again. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. All right, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do it like I, we were going to, like you've had been in some revivals that might have made you uncomfortable. But I want to do this one time. I want you to close your eyes, all of you. And I want you to be honest before God. And say, man, this has been tough. If it's been tough, raise your hand. I want you to know, as we all raise our hands, God's got a purpose for us. He's got a purpose for us as individuals. He's got a purpose for us together as a church. And God's going to lead us to the place of His blessing, just as He would for Paul. As all this life around us is built up on us, let's not forget we serve the one who's greater than this life, who says He'll never leave us nor forsake us. Let's haul the car go back on. Let's remember our purpose. Let's remember that He can navigate the seas that we cannot. Let's remember He's provided for us in community. Let's remember these things. Let's add them back to our life. And let's sail for God's destination of transformation and hope. You can put your hands down. This morning you're burdened and you want to be prayed for, I invite you to come. Altar, maybe God's calling you to confess faith in Jesus Christ. Maybe He's calling you to join this church in any way that we receive members. I don't know how God's working, but I know this. He is working.
and he always does. As musicians come forward, you're welcome to come. I'll mask up and we'll pray together. I give him that look over his shoulder like, all right, come on, we've got to go. Um, so I got it from Will today. <laughs> You've been practicing, haven't you? <laughs> this afternoon, um, Robert Burns will not be having Sunday school. He'll hope to get that started back up. It's still a little treacherous in places around the back uh, the parking lot, so we're going to, and some of the side roads are still a little slippery, and I know the kids are maybe on the bubble. Do we want to go to school tomorrow? Or we'd like just one more day off. I, I know, I know. So I guess we'll find out uh, this afternoon at some point uh, the prognosis for uh, our back roads in Gibson County. Anyway, uh, thank you for being here this Wednesday night at 6 o'clock. We will be having uh, confirmation here in the, uh, in the sanctuary. Brett will be having youth in the, uh, in the fellowship hall. And we're going to um, begin again to see that the week after we'll have our continuing Bible study on the book of Jude. So the second part of the book of Jude, which isn't very long, but uh, I couldn't get through it in one time. Imagine that. Imagine me being long-winded. Yeah, you aren't supposed to laugh. Anyway, uh, 
Any other announcements for the good of the group? All right, thank you for being here. Father, I pray your blessings upon this family of faith. I pray that you'd strengthen them, nurture them, and that you would heal them, give them hope, a good conscience. Remind them, Lord, Lord, that you, through every storm that rages, are constant. And you, Lord, indeed, are our northern star. By you, we find our way home. Bless our homes. Bless every opportunity we receive this week in life. And help us to be strengthened for your purpose. And to return here in hope and truth and healing and in love. Amen. Love is turning on the t-